Amen. You may be seated. He is worthy. You know, when I sing that song, I really, a lot of times I just get humbled, like, man, I'm not even worthy to sing you're worthy. <laughs> and, uh, but we are worthy because of what Christ has done. But it is humbling to know that God loves us and, and that, that we can sing something meaningful to him that makes his heart happy. I mean, who are we? In fact, the psalmist says, who is man that you would even consider him? But we were made a little lower than the angels, and somehow he's allowed us to gain access to his affections and his heart. I couldn't be more happy. And uh, so I'm, I'm really thankful for that. I've, um, we're learning through the book of Revelation that we aren't, we're, we're not going to be here, but there are lessons to pull out of here for us to apply the Bible is, for the Bible inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God will be equipped in everything. So we know that's true. Now, if you don't have one of those Bibles in your hands, and you want to read one and along with this, lift your hand and we'll get you one. You can follow right along. Anybody else up here? Um, sure. All right. Well, okay, where are we in the book of Revelation? We're at chapter 11. So, so far we have seen that the rapture has taken place in four. Then the seals, that there are seven seals that are judgments and that are, that are unleashed. And then um, we went through the seven, first seven seals. Now we're in the seven trumpet judgments. And we're in between six and seven in, uh, on the trumpet judgments, which, that, which is an interlude. And it's sort of like an intermission. Last week we learned about the two, or, the, or I'm sorry, the, the little book that, that um, what was the little book. And, and this is all part of the interlude between six and seven. Now this week um, we're going to learn about the third temple. Now it depends on how you look at it because it begins in verse one and two. But um, the first temple was... Um, made by, well, it was designed by God, but it was made by Solomon. Prior to that, there was a tabernacle that Moses carried around the wilderness. So then all of a sudden, David wanted to make God a house, and the Lord told David, well, here's the deal. He's, uh, he goes to Nathan, David does, and says, hey, listen, um, man, I love to make the Lord a house, make him a home. And Nathan says, go for it. And then that night, when Nathan was trying to sleep, he couldn't sleep, and the Lord spoke to him and said, don't you be telling kings what to do unless you confer with me first. So he, in fact, Nathan had to go to David and said, David, you, you're not the one to build the house and build the temple for the Lord. It's going to be your son Solomon. You're a man of bloodshed and war. But David was just as happy to have his son in the ministry or, or building the temple, if you will. And uh, so I've often... Um, I've often thought about my life and my kids are doing some things that I thought I was going to do like music and it wasn't me it was my other boys that are going to do the music and uh, I you know I still do it but not a whole lot but so anyway <clears throat> the first temple was made by King Solomon and um, and we know that on Mount Moriah where the temple is um, uh, is or was I guess you should say and Mount Moriah is a pretty important place. In fact, I would say Mount Moriah is one of the most important plots of land on the planet Earth. A lot happened at Mount Moriah, if you will. Um, if you remember, Abraham took Isaac up and he was going to sacrifice his only son uh, to the Lord. And of course, what happened was he gets to the top. He's about ready to plunge the knife into his son's heart, and the Holy or the, an angel of the Lord grabbed his hand and stopped him. And and then he said, "Isaac will be the one that the whole world will be blessed by." So Isaac um, didn't didn't get sacrificed at that time, and uh, and he was going to be the blessing for the whole world, and the seed of Abraham will come from Isaac and Abraham. Um, so there's a lot of things that happened. Jesus was crucified on the area of the uh, Golgotha or Mount Moriah. Um, and so, and, and that was where, again, the first temple was made. Now, if you remember, the first temple after it was made, uh, Israel started slipping and serving other gods and worshiping other 
idols and gods. Of course, there are no other gods except for the Lord God. Um, so what happened was Nebuchadnezzar, who was this big heavy-duty um, Assyrian king, came down and he, uh, he took, um, well, ba- in fact, it was, it was a Babylonian king, and he came down and took Israel captive and for 70 years, and he destroyed the first temple that Solomon made, totally flattened it out. So there was no temple for 70 years. And in 70 years of captivity that Israel, and reason, and, and just by a side note, the reason Israel went into captivity for 70 years, again, like they were worshiping other gods, and God had told them through Jeremiah, you might as well get comfortable the 70 years here, here in Babylon, because you're going to be here 70 years, and I'm not letting you go till the end of that 70 years. And so, basically what happened was at the end of 70 years, a decree, a decree was um, uh, um, made, and Ezra took a bunch of Jewish people from Babylon to build the temple. And a lot of things had happened during that time. And the temple was postponed a few times. But the long and short of it, it's, it the, the temple got built. And it wasn't near the, the um, prestigious beauty that King, so- or King Solomon's was. And, uh, and they called it the Zerubbabel Temple. Because Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel was the governor at that time. And so that temple got built. And interesting about that temple, it's on Mount Moriah, this big famous mountain where everything happens. Um, but when the temple was built, uh, the people were rejoicing and the young people were really rejoicing that the temple was back intact. But the older saints that had seen Solomon's temple went, this isn't anything like Solomon's temple, and they wept. So the, the scriptures has it, while, while the people were rejoicing, the older people were, were weeping in the background because it wasn't near the glory of Solomon's. So anyway, that temple hung around a while, stayed around until Jesus' time, and then King Herod wanted to make an improvement on that temple, Zerubbabel's temple, which was the second temple. And so he, he, he built up and around it, and uh, he really didn't build another temple per se, but he really redid it. That could be called the third temple, but we're just going to call for the sake of argument the second temple. Now, are you all confused? The second temple was Herod's temple, and that was during Jesus' time. Well, what happened during Jesus' time that uh, um, the Jewish people got really persecuted, and a, a Roman general by the name of Titus came in in 70 AD, and Titus destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple completely. Now, if you remember, Jesus prophesied that the temple would be completely destroyed and there would not be left one block on another. And that came true because when the Roman soldiers went there, they burnt down the temple, and all the gold in the temple melted into all the floor joists and the joints. And all, all the, so they would take all the blocks apart to get the gold out that had melted in the, um, uh, in, in the um, joints of, of the concrete. So anyway, that's when Jesus said not one uh, boulder or not one uh, block will be on another. So basically that came true. So there is no temple. And now we're up to date here in the, re- in, in the time of Revelation. And here's where it starts with verse 11. There was given me a measuring rod. So John was giving a measuring rod. It was like a staff. Now, a measuring rod apparently was nine foot long, and it was six cubits. So a cubit would be from the end of your elbow to the end of your finger. So six cubits would be a... uh, um, a rod that will be nine foot long. So he was told to measure. He said, get up and measure the temple of God. Now, there, as you know, there is no temple right now, but this is in, the, he's measuring a temple because he's seeing it in um, the tribulation. Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. So basically, when the Lord measures something, it means he owns it. It's mine. I'm measuring it. I own it. So he's talking about the temple being his. And, leave, and then he makes an interesting comment. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it. For it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months, which is another three and a half years. So we're halfway into the um, uh, tribulation. And, and he said, leave out the court. Now, 
I don't know a lot about the different, um, uh, di you know, dynamics about the temple, where it's going to be, where it was. They're not totally sure where it was, but there are some people in the Temple Institute, and uh, they, there are guys that study this whole thing. Um, they're, they're saying that if they, they have to tear down the mosque, the dome of the mosque is where the um, a temple should have been, and they don't. And if they tore down the dome of the mosque for the Muslims, that would be World War III. So that's not happening now. They're not doing that. But basically, the long and short of it, um, and it's interesting. There's new research that they 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 found out that actually the temple is. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I, just, I don't have a map, but it's north of where they thought it would be, meaning that they could build without um, causing problem with the Muslims, then they, but they would build a wall, and Ezekiel talks about building a wall, and because the court of the Gentiles is outside of the temple itself, and so that's what he's saying, um, leave out the court which is a, a outside the temple, that would be called the court of the Gentiles. So what it means to you and I is this, that the temple is going to get built during the tribulation. I don't know if the tribulation uh, temple is the same as the millennial temple, the Ezekiel. Um, so I, should, I was going to call you, Joe, and find out what you thought about that. I haven't been able to find out for sure whether, again, the tribulation temple and the millennial temple are the same. Um, they might have different characteristics but so this is what he's telling him i want you to to measure that and leave the outer court alone so that that really works with what's going on now and and i think that makes more sense so um you can study it it's 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 sometimes kind of confusing to understand where the temple is going to go where it should where it could go where it might have gone so okay so now Verse 3 says, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for the twelve um, for twelve hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. So there's some witnesses that are coming out, and they're going to prophesy for three and a half years. Now, this is at the very beginning of the tribulation. So these two witnesses, and we'll get into who they might be. Uh, we don't have any, you know, clear-cut um, instruction of who these may be, but, and these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. That's pretty, that sounds like a sci-fi movie, somebody spitting out, belching out fire. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the, day, uh, during the days of their prophesying, and they will have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. And interesting, as often as they should desire. That's a pretty interesting term. Now, who are these um, two guys? And uh, it's interesting, you know, I do know this, that when the first temple is made, let's go back in history, um, the first temple is, uh, or the, the temple in the tribulation is, is actually put up, there's a guy by the name of Antioch Epiphanes that, that we, have, we draw a lesson from, but the Antichrist is going to come into the temple because he's going to make a, um, and I'm, I'm going to divert from the two witnesses for just a moment, so stay with me. Um, what happened is the very first of the tribulation the Antichrist makes a seven-year bargain or you know, treaty with the Jewish people. And, and during that time, he's going to allow the Jewish people to build their temple and allow them to do animal sacrifices. In the very middle, according to Daniel 9, 27, in the very middle of that uh, um, week that he gives them or that treaty he's going to come up into the temple stop all the animal sacrifices and then demand that he be worshiped and that's called the abomination of desolation spoken of in daniel jesus talked about it in matthew 24 and so he's going to come in and say no more uh, i mean he's going to really tick the jews off is what's going to happen no more animal sacrifices and you will worship me 
And so what happens is that's when he comes in to power, and the last three and a half years of tribulation is really crazy. So I want to interject that before we get to the two witnesses. Sorry, I kind of got ahead of myself there. But, but the two witnesses. So he says, and I will grant authority to two witnesses. Um, who are those two witnesses? Well, um, a lot of people speculate. Some people think it's um, Elijah, which I will probably agree with the one Elijah. And, um, and then they think maybe Enoch, um, because Enoch didn't die, and Elijah didn't die. Elijah, Elijah was taken in First Kings uh, or Second Kings away by a chariot of fire. So um, the scripture says in Hebrews 9:27. And inasmuch as it is appointed, appointed to die once, after this comes judgment. So those, those two guys didn't die, so they're thinking, well, they got to die sometime, so they're going to come back and die during this time in the tribulation. I don't think it's Enoch, because we don't have enough proof. But I do see that it very well could be Elijah. Malachi 3, 5 through 6. And you can turn there if you want, or I can just read it to you. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the a great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. So I believe that this, is, this very well could be Elijah, and there's many other reasons um, if you remember Elijah on the, the mount, um, uh, what was in the mount where he fought the um, um, prophets of Baal, if you will, they didn't fight them, but there was a little a skirmish going on in power. And um, so it, what happened was when he's on, on mount, uh, yeah, mount Carmel, um, he challenged the prophets of Baal and said, hey, listen, why don't you put a sacrifice out and you ask your God to call down fire and to absorb and just take care of the sacrifice. It's like calling down fire from heaven. And so they put a sacrifice out, put stones around it, and basically they danced around and cut themselves and clear up until noon. And I like what, um, if, you, if you read the... Um, you read the thing. Well, if you read about it in Kings, basically what he says is that, hey, is your, is your God... You know, is he out to lunch? Is he taking a nap? Um, is he, and some of your translations said, is he on the toilet? And uh, where is your God at? And he, so basically there was nothing happening. And then, then um, uh, basically what Elijah said is put down the sacrifice, put water all over it, put water on the wood and make trench, uh, trench around the, the, um, the sacrifice, fill it up till the trench fills up. And then I will call down fire and he calls down fire and bam. God takes the sacrifice. He calls down fire on that. And I think that's really interesting because he's getting used to calling down fire and he's going to be belching it probably here in the last days. But, and then, of course, he, he called for no rain in 1 Kings 17.1. For three and a half years, it didn't rain, if you remember, and there was a drought in the land. James even said it in chapter 5, verse 17 through 18, that he was a man with a nature like ours. So we do believe that, you know, he, he did call for a drought. He did call for fire. That wasn't the only time he used fire. One other time, which is uh, interesting, is when the king sent men after um, Elijah because the, he was mad because of the drought. So he sent a captain and 50 men the first time, and they found Elijah. And Elijah said, if I am a man of God, then fire will come down and consume you guys. <laughs> 50 people just burnt, crispy critters. The captain goes back and says, man, you wouldn't believe what just happened. So he brings 50 more men to capture him. And uh, Elijah once again said, hey, listen, if I'm not a man of God, if I'm a man of God, fire will come down from heaven. And fire came down from heaven and burnt them up. So the captain comes back the third time with the group. And he said, hey, listen, you don't have to prove anything. We just, he, and so anyway, the guy really, Elijah's used to, used to, so I think about it, if he's used to calling down fire, maybe this is the guy, I don't know, could be. Um, but, and then, of course, um, Elijah was with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. And uh, God had spoken, in fact, when he met um, 
Jesus, they both did Moses and Elijah. They were talking about Jesus' death to, on the cross. So we kind of get the idea that these guys are pretty heavy-duty prophets in the, in the kingdom. And so I, then I think, some people think it was John the Baptist. I think J. Vernon McGee thinks it's John, John the Baptist. Some say it's Enoch. It could be Enoch. I think it fits um, Elijah and Moses better. Um, some people thought it was Zerubbabel and Joshua because it talks about um, and the two olive trees and the two lampstands. If you go to Zechariah, and you'll read there in Zechariah where it talks about the two um, olive trees and the two lampstands. And, but that in that text, it is talking actually about Zerubbabel, the governor of Jerusalem at that time, and it's talking about Joshua, not the one that, that went in into the promised land, but Joshua, a high priest. So I don't think it was those two guys. You can look it up and read it. It reads almost exactly the same way. These are the two um, um, witnesses, olive tree, the olive trees and the two lampstands. So I'm, I'm kind of leaning toward Moses and Elijah, and a lot of your commentators do. So why do we think it's a Moses? There's a lot of things about Moses. Moses turned water to blood, so he's, he's got some practice there. He's um, called down ten plagues, and so the, these guys will be able to call plagues down. So I'm thinking, yeah, that would work, but I, I, there was a slant on Moses that I really, um, I was really looking at his life. Now, if you remember Moses' life, he, he takes Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, and they walk around into the wilderness for 40 years, and he's headed for the promised land. But the people are grumbling and things like that. Well, Moses, while he was heading to the promised land, they're in the wilderness, um, the people started griping and complaining, and he got upset with them. And the Lord said, I want you to speak to this rock so water will come out and they'll be able to drink it. And Moses um, got mad at the, and hit, it actually smoked the rock and hit it with a, with a stick. Water came out, but the Lord was not pleased. The reason he wasn't pleased, because Moses was angry with Israel, and he misrepresented God because God was not mad at Israel at that time. The first time he spoke to the rock, boom, water came out. The second time when he hit the rock, he was angry. And so the Lord said, you're not going into the promised land because of that. And, um, and so the remember Moses kept trying to talk. I'm like, oh, I mean, Lord, can I go? I don't know how it went down. But if it were me, Lord, can I please go into the promised land? And the Lord basically said this, don't talk to me about it or with me any more about it. You're not going to the promised land. And it was the last thing Moses heard. He's going, okay, I'm not going to the promised land. And, uh, but I'll let you see it from a, a distance. So he went up to Mount Pisgah, looked over the land, and, and he saw the promised land, but he didn't get to go in it. And uh, so I thought, that's really interesting. He didn't get to go in it, but he makes two cameo appearances on the planet Earth after that. And, you know, it, it, it'd be hard to swallow that you were called to bring your people out of a, a bondage and you didn't get to go into the land with them. So I don't think, and you know, he was 120 when he died. <clears throat> he was up on the mountain and said his eyes were stronger than ever. <clears throat> he, he was, uh, he had not lost any strength. But he could still pump iron. I mean, he was, a, he was in pretty good shape. And so, so I don't know what the guy died, what Moses died of, but. So anyway, but the last words he heard were that you're not going to go into the land. But yet he makes, again, like I said, two cameo appearances. And I just think that's kind of like God, isn't it? When we think we've totally blown it. I mean, he did die at peace with God up in the mountain. And I don't know what all happened. There was a battle. We'll talk about that between Michael and Satan. But I do believe that he might have been, he might have left the planet a little like, boy, I wish I could have. So the Lord said, hey, I'll let you go down and talk to Jesus. So he goes down and he talks to Jesus with Elijah and talks about the cross. And I think he was one of the two witnesses. I want you to go in, and the first half of tribulation, I'm going to give you a job. And you'll be belching out fire and setting plagues, and you'll be walking around in sackcloth. And it was almost like, I don't know, but it was just, I just think God is so faithful. The moment you think you might be through, and 
I, th I think when you get to a point with your walk with the Lord and you've been familiar with a lot of things, a lot of ministry, a lot of teaching, and a lot of things like that, that sometimes you wonder, Lord, you know, I, am, have I lost my effectiveness? And I can only speak from experience, but I talk to other men who feel, who, who have went through that. Have I lost my effectiveness? And am I still, or have I done something to misrepresent you? Because you're not angry. Am I, am I represent, misrepresenting you somewhere? And God wasn't necessarily mad at Moses, but he said, Moses, I can't let you go on after you smack the rock and look, and I, I have to do something with you. So I take him up heaven, chastise him? No. I don't know what he did, but I do know this, that God gave him this, uh, this other chance to go down and do a great work. Did a great work during the tribulation for three and a half years stood and i don't know if they had a headquarters during that time and i it, it sounded like they when they had um sackcloth on if you know what sackcloth is it's camel hair and they take a camel's hide and they finish it out and then they put the camel hair on the inside and the leather on the outside and you could you imagine wearing that for three and a half years you'd be belching fire too <laughs> but um so they were called to to really and anybody tried to harm them boom they, they couldn't harm. They're, in fact, they were virtually indestructible until they were through. They, they, no one could touch them. The beast that kills them, but no one could touch them. But I just want to encourage you, no matter where you are in your walk with the Lord, and you may think that maybe, you know, I, I'm going to never go to the promise. I'm not going to be able to finish out well, Lord. What am I? And I just want to encourage you. God knows where you're at. And he is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And we think we've blown it. And I just, I, I'm so encouraged by what the Lord has done with Moses here and gave him this chance. But, but just want to back up a moment. When Moses died on top of the mountain, there was a battle between Michael, the archangel, like no one's above Michael. He's it. Um, I think the only other archangel that existed, which I, Gabriel, I don't think is an archangel. He's like the big boy. He's the warrior angel. He, you, know, you find him fighting everywhere around in the Bible. The prince of Persia and Daniel <coughs> um, withstood him <coughs> for I don't know how long, and he broke through. Michael broke through and fought for, the, for um, Daniel so that the prayer could get through. But anyway, they were, they were, um, there was a battle. And I don't know whether Satan knew that God was going to use Moses in the last days to thwart some of his work in the first three and a half years. I don't think Satan is omnipresent. In fact, I know Satan is not omniscient. omniscient. He doesn't know all things. He can't read the future. And I thought about the story of Job when he asked God, hey, listen, Job serves you because, but let me at him. Well, he wouldn't go after Job unless he thought he could win the battle. But there's not a lot of sermons about Job uh, 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 that much, but there are a lot of sermons about the end times and how, who people think these two witnesses are. So you think Satan has heard the teaching that goes out across the body of Christ that they think maybe Moses is the one that's going to be the one, the one of the witnesses. And do you think maybe he thought, maybe if I could stop Moses at, and thwart his burial somehow, he won't come back and be a witness. I don't know. That's just my warp thinking. But I thought, I thought that there had to be a battle for some reason. Some commentators say that the battle was because um, Satan wanted to know where Moses would be buried. He would expose it to the people, and the people would come and worship and make a shrine out of it. And that's one school thought. I don't know if i go with that. I don't even know why the battle was totally, but I do think Moses was a threat to Satan. Remember, Peter was a threat. To Satan, yeah. Peter basically, um, he, P, um, Satan came to the Lord and said, "Hey, listen, um, I like to sift him like we." And the Lord said, I, "I'll pray for him. He knows who is going to be um, a detriment to his kingdom. He knows you, and he knows me. And you don't have to be a Moses or a Peter for Satan to come out after you." He would love to just stagnate you or make you feel like, hey, listen, I'm not usable at all. And like I said, 
That's a battle of age old times. Satan, our enemy, does not want you serving Jesus. He doesn't want you waking up in the morning and doing your devotions and loving on Jesus <coughs> and, 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 then, and then, you know, influencing his kingdom. He knows who are a threat. So if you're going through some warfare, let me just encourage you. It's because possibly Satan views you as a threat in his kingdom. And again, you don't have to be this massive, big televangelist or prophet. But if you love Jesus and you're laying witness to the people around you, you are doing God's will and his bidding. And you've not blown it. You've not blown it. Even though you may think that you've, you're not living for him, you're not doing things right, he's just saying to you, I, I'm a God of second, third, fourth, fifth chances. I love you. And I have a plan. So we see that... <coughs> We see that they de- the, the things that happen, they devour, they shut up the sky, <coughs> and they do it at their desire. Now, verse 7, when they have finished their testimony, then the beast that comes out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. So that will be the Antichrist. And he is a, these two guys are enough of a threat that the Antichrist himself goes and battles and wars with the two and kills them. Now, if you know anything about the beast that comes out of the sea, that is the Antichrist. The dragon is Satan, (coughs) and the um, false prophet is the false prophet. It's the unholy trinity. But the beast is called out, and they kill them. And it says, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So he kills them and he lays them in the middle of the street somewhere in Jerusalem. And they just lay them there to rot for three and a half days. And now why they call it mystically called Sodom and Egypt, I, I, I'm not totally sure. I do know that Sodom was judged because of the homosexuality. I mean, there's a lot of things that Sodom was judged for, but because of the homosexual sin that was so rampant. And, and I think today we are, we are um, walking up close to that same barometer. Um, and then, he, then it was Egypt, and Egypt is always a type of the world. So it very well could be at that point in time, Jerusalem was very, very carnal, maybe even liberal like <coughs> we are in, 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 in America and, and being more and more like the world. Are we being more like, we're, we're not even like the world anymore. We're like some foreign country in a, in a often space land somewhere. It's crazy. So anyway, um, this, and, but it was where the Lord was crucified, so I do know it's Jerusalem. Those from the peoples and the tribes and the tongues and nations will look on their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in the tomb. So again, for three and a half days, they will lay out in the streets and their body will become putrid and begin to rot. And now Martin Luther, when, uh, and, and then let me read 10, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another and cause those two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. But the peoples and all nations and tongues will see them. Martin Luther didn't think that, he kind of lost faith a little bit in Revelation because he thought, how can that be? They're they're not going to be able to see these two prophets. Well, we got technology and satellite imagery, and we got all the social media. We can watch someone for three days die and be dead in the streets but but he didn't really see it then so he was almost going to you know discount the book of revelation i'm glad he didn't yeah that would have been a little bit hard to swallow from martin but but anyway so we had the technology cnn fox news they could be honing in there and for three and, and notice that for three and a half days and when they died the it, it, there was a satanic christmas People were, were happy. They were sending gifts and going, oh my gosh, these guys that reaped havoc for three and a half years are gone. Hey, I'll give you, and they started giving gifts to one another, celebrating the death of these men. Today, these, these people are very, 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 very bitter with, against these two witnesses. They hated them, everything they stood for. And I think what we're going through today in the church is that you are, you are not liked 
it, it used to be you might be able to disagree and have maybe left and right or whatever, Democrat, Republican, it's all the same anymore, who knows. But, but when people, when you differ with people on issues like immigration and crime in, in, the, in the White House and, and homosexuality, they don't like you. I mean, in fact, it's not like they disagree with you, they hate you. And the level of hatred that has happened in our country, and I've talked about it often here from the pulpit, is really ramped up, and it seems to be getting more and more ramped up. But could you imagine that? And this is on steroids. They, they hated those two guys so much that they had a holiday. And I do believe in the last days, as Timothy says, men will be lovers themselves, <coughs> haters of God, haters of parents, and you read that whole list in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and you just walk down that list, and you can say, boom, 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 we are there. And where we're at, church, Harvest Chapel should not surprise you, because God has warned us and told us for years it would happen like this, and it would shake out. Now, I didn't think it would shake out this fast, but we are in communism, the only thing we got that's going is there's a constituency of people that are not wanting to be that way, and they're kind of starting to speak out a little bit more. But we're in socialism, Marxism, whatever you want to call it. It's all, it, it, we are there. We're being canceled. We're, the whole idea of communism is, is in our midst, and it's not an idea anymore. It's, it's upon us. <clears throat> but we still, like I said, have we, there is a... Um, a group of people that are, and a lot of them are believers, but are conservative, who are not going to go along with it. So I don't know if we're going to succumb to this this time or not. I, I, you know, I don't know what the Lord's last days plans. <coughs> I think this could be the very last part of the church's um, influence in the world, that we can see a great revival happen and, and as, as a result of all the corruption that's going on. Why not? It's like it's a great time to tell people about Jesus because they're just they're asking people. But I just looked at the state of the world at that time, and where are we today? The state of the world today, it's it's really it's really close. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them. I love that. After three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them. It's your breath in our lungs, that we, so we pour out our praise. God breathed into those guys, and those people who are sending gifts probably, I want my gift back, you know. They're, they're freaking out because these guys stood up. I don't know what they did, but it looks like they stood up, and the Lord said, come up here, and everybody heard it. <clears throat> and that's not the mid-trib rapture, so some people hold to that. It's not. But he told them to um, um, come up here. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. Then they went up into heaven in the clouds and their enemies watched them. I mean, they're all going, oh, did you just see what we saw? Three days, they were, three and a half days, they were dead. I mean, it sounds like a sci-fi movie. And, you know, you're probably saying, well, why does this, why do we teach this? Because it has no application. We won't be here. Guys, the principles are all there for us that are woven through the scriptures, that we are to be ready. And you can get so hard that you would be a person like one of the, if, you do, if, if we were to give in totally to our flesh, we would be just like these people. But by the grace of God, there goes, Tom, there goes me, Tom Camp, and you can put your name. By the grace of God, there go I. We're so, I'm so thankful that it won't be in that number. Verse 13, and in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. That would be Jerusalem. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. So it means basically 7,000 people died. Some were probably believers. Some of them weren't. But what happened was people got saved as a result of the earthquake. But notice the number, one-tenth. Not one-tenth point one. Not 7,000 people in one, it was 7,000 people. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and he knew every one of those people, and I'm not saying they were, because some of them very well could have been believers that perished, but he knew every one of them. Nothing happens out of God's 
direct care and concern that, that he doesn't understand or know. He knows when a sparrow falls. <clears throat> he knows in every hair in your head. And some of you don't have that much. I just happen to have some. And I'm, I, I would be good without it. I'm good. Um, because a good man always comes out on top. I just lost myself there. <laughs> but he knew every one of them. And he, and he loved every one of them. <clears throat> and even when people perish who don't know him, he doesn't go, good, I got rid of them. No, he, 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 he grieves over the loss of those who will not enter eternity to be with him. Guys, it's so important that we tell people about Jesus. It's so important that your witness is real. You don't just, I mean, you can come to church and get fed and become a fat Christian. And, you know, I think um, I, Amy Grant wrote a song, um, Too Fat to Fly, Chubby Chubby. Anybody remember that? Because you get, you're just getting fed all the time and you're not giving out. I think it's good that we make some kind of effort to talk to our neighbor or talk to somebody we work with or talk to people about Jesus. Why not? After all, he saved your sorry soul and my sorry soul. Why don't we tell him about who, what God did in our lives? But he knows all these people, and I believe the number is significant to let us know that he doesn't want any to perish, but all come to repentance. That, according to Timothy, it's his will that all men be saved. So, verse 14, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there was a loud, there were voices in heaven saying, now this is like a praise. This is like the, the heavens recognizing that Jesus is winning, okay, but, and, and that his rule is going to take, and they already know that, but the kingdom of, of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Can you wait to hear that? That the kingdom of the world and what we see right now is going to be God's kingdom, and everything's going to change everything's going to change. We're going to walk in power. We're going to walk in love. We're going to walk with no sin and no temptation and no news to watch how bad the world's going. Stay away from it if you can. And he will reign forever and ever and ever and ever. There's no end to his reign, guys. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. The church, that's who the church, the church is like, whoom, whoom, whoom. they're just falling on their face all the time up there. And I thought while we were singing this morning, we had some words that were very conducive for our worship. And if you didn't enter in, tough, well, I shouldn't say tough, but we have, we have some songs that, that bring forth word, that bring, evoke praise in us. And they're praising God because he's reigning forever and ever. Guys, you have a lot to be thankful for th today. You have a lot to praise him for. And the words of these songs are, are, are meant to bring you into a p position where you're worshiping on your, your spiritual face before God. You bow your heart before him. The highest thing that we can do is praise and give him glory. The second thing is to love the world that, uh, enough to, to tell them about Jesus. Then, then it says, saying, this is what they say, we give you thanks, O Lord, the Almighty. The word for Almighty, Almighty there is Pantocrator, but it, basically what it means is God the highest on every level. He is the highest in heaven. He's the highest of the earth. He's the highest of my, mankind. On every level, he is the highest. Who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And this is in the last part of the judgments that he's beginning to reign. And his power is now going to be displayed. This next three and a half, um, as we go through the rest of the book of Revelation, it'll go a little faster and um, but we're going to see his judgment and his reign come into power and the nations were enraged and your wrath came and the time came for the dead to be judged and the time to reward your bond servants the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name the small and the great and to destroy those who destroy the earth 
the nations were enraged. You know, if you ever turn to, if you ever read Psalm 2, if you want to turn there, you can because it's worth reading. I just think, why are people so mad? Because they're not getting their sinful way. They're like little kids and they're mad. Let's see, Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them and he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Why are the nations, the nations are mad right now. And they're enraged. And this is what he's saying. The nations were enraged. And your wrath came and it began to judge. And then he talks about all the people that have been saved from the time of Adam and Eve. <clears throat> clear up to where we're at there. Every person that has given their life to Christ or knew a Messiah to come. Small and great. That, that he's talking about that throng of people, millions and millions and millions of people, <coughs> and to destroy those who destroy the earth. That's not good news for the earth dwellers and those who tr hug trees and love environmentalists. That's not good for them. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened. I love this. The, 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 because the temple of God, we're supposed to make the temple, or the temple down here is supposed to be replicated with the one in heaven. So it got, it was opened, and notice what they see. And the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. I mean, we're talking about earthquakes all over the place. And then a hailstorm, and we do, do know that some of the hailstorms are going to have 100-pound hailstones. That would do some damage to the house. That knocked down your antenna and put a hole in your car. But notice what they see. And we'll close with this. And the Ark of the Covenant appeared in his temple. Now, what is the Ark symbolic? Of? What was in the original Ark? You remember it was the Ten Commandments. And it was Aaron's rod that budded. And it was the manna. It was the law that was given, the law, and then the resurrection of Jesus in Aaron's bud, budding rod, and then the manna was Jesus, the, he fulfilled the law. And when you looked at that entire, and I don't know if you know about much about the ark, but they would go in and splash blood in front of it, or they would put blood on the horns for the sacrifice. And if you look up there, God's saying, it's done. Here's the Ark of the Covenant. Everything that has been talked about in the past about Jesus and my coming, it's done. And we're looking into heaven. And guys, there's where I plan to put my eyes. I got rebuked this week in my Bible study by the Word of God in Philippians. It said, do everything without grumbling and complaining. And man, I can watch the news and look over at Terry and go, did you see that? I and I just get all like, are you kidding me? Are they? <coughs> and, the, and honestly, the Lord spoke to me. I mean, I do think we need to speak up and push back. Yeah. But grumble and complain. And I have been so, gr I'm grumbling. My blood pressure gets high. I get a headache. And I got a, and then Terry just said, stop. And I'm going, I don't want to. <laughs> and then the Lord spoke to me. said, Tom, you are doing way too much complaining about the world. You got to stop and look at, he opened the temple and showed you the ark, his victory, everything about his word, about the resurrection of Christ and the fulfillment of the law is done. And I can look at the whole earth is full of his glory. And I don't have to see all the negative stuff. I've got to change my heart. And again, I, don't, I think we should push back and be opposed to things that are evil. And we're not going to say, oh, that's evil. <laughs> I mean, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm thinking that, guys, our, our heart should be, as it, he's showing us his ark. 
He's showing us the splendor of heaven, that it's all finished, and it, as good as done, we just got to finish out our last few days here. And some of us may not have as many as others. I don't know. And if it's the rapture, we're all going. Does anybody believe in the rapture in this room? But I sure hope so because, man, that is the blessed hope that Titus talks about. Do you believe that the whole earth is full of his glory? And we can see the goodness of God. Even in wickedness, we can overlook the wickedness and say in my heart, and I want to be a different person. I have been humbled. And it's not confession time, but it sort of is. I've been humbled lately about a lot of things. And, and, and I told somebody the other day when I gave my testimony, I went to the jail the other day. I'm going to go to the prison Friday. And I'm going to share the testimony that God's given me. And I'm going to evangelize. And it's like God's just given me somewhat of a rebirth and an idea that, that Tom, you, you need to share the goodness of God when you first got saved. And I started recounting all the things God brought me through. I wrecked a motorcycle over by the country club and almost died. I mean, things like I could tell you stories that you would go, what? Maybe you have some of those stories. I'm humbled by what God has done for me, and I don't want to forget it. The rock that I was hewn from, not look back at the plow, but I've been reminded again that God has brought me out of so much, guys, that in the joy of the Lord, when I first got saved, was like, man, I don't smoke weed anymore. I don't have to do all that stuff anymore. I don't have to sell dope. I don't have to fight. I don't have to do any of that. I just got to love Jesus. I got to tell people about Jesus. And I want to see your glory, Lord. And I think that in my last few days, I want to be able to walk it out. My heart for you is that let God open the temple and show you his ark show you his love for you and how he has won the battle and everything about the law and Jesus fulfilling the law and the resurrection has given us life. I've come, he said, to give you life and life more abundantly. I've come so that you could bear fruit and so prove to be my disciples. I've come to give you joy, the same joy that the Father and I have, that same joy. That's pretty joyful. I don't see Jesus ever going, oh, geez, I'm sick of this whole thing. He's joyful through the whole. I believe he, he grieves at sin, but his heart, I want Jesus' heart. So, guys, I think it'd be wise for us to just stand up now and me to shut up. <laughs> and as you're standing and we sing, some of you in here, again, probably, a lot of you all know the Lord, so we're going to go. I do want to share, if you don't know Jesus, you've not made a commitment to him, then I'm going to ask that you make your way forward and pray. We could pray with you and introduce you to him. We could tell you more about him because he loves you. If you're here and you just need prayer, maybe you just need somebody to lift you up in prayer because things are heavy in your life. Maybe you haven't viewed the ark. Or maybe you felt like Moses when the Lord said, don't talk to me about it anymore. Oh, maybe you're in that point, but God says, no, he is going to give you the second, third, and fourth chances. Think about what he did with Moses. He, he, he finished out great. He finished out fantastic. So if you feel like you want, you need prayer this morning or you want to come to Christ, you make your way up here and we would love to pray with you.